Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Jim Ryan, and on behalf of all of us here at UVA, I'd like to thank you for joining in this conversation. Uh, like many of you, I have Zoomed with a lot of people over the last several months, but this is the first time I've had the honor of Zooming with a prime minister. My only hope is that our family cat doesn't choose this moment to walk across the keyboard as she's done several times over the last couple of months, but I can't make any promises. Um, today, we are thrilled to have the Prime Minister of Greece, the Honorable Kyriakos Mitsotakos, to talk about, among other things, how his country handled the pandemic and any lessons we might learn for our own response. We're also grateful to be partnering with Brookings. Brookings and UVA have shared faculty and worked together on events for at least four decades. And in a minute, in a minute I'll hand things over to the President of Brookings, General John Allen. But before I do, I'd like to share three brief reasons why I've been so looking forward to this event. First and foremost, we have an opportunity to hear from a world leader who has largely succeeded in spreading in containing the spread of COVID-19 in his country. Greece has just under 11 million people, but only about 3,000 confirmed COVID-19 cases and less than 200 fatalities. These are some of the lowest numbers, not just in Europe, but around the globe. Some of the success is due to the fact that the prime minister acted quickly following the advice of public health experts. His team developed implemented and enforced a detailed plan, and he communicated with the Greek people regularly and clearly. As our own university and other universities face some difficult decisions in the next few weeks about the fall, I'm especially interested in how the prime minister is thinking about reopening Greece, just as tourist season is getting started. The second reason I'm thrilled to have the prime minister with us is that Greece and UVA share a bond grounded in democracy. Greece, as you all know, invented democracy, and UVA's founding was closely tied to the founding of our American, dem American democracy. And in fact, Thomas Jefferson designed UVA as a modern version of the Academy in Athens, not just architecturally, but as one of the very first institutions focused on educating citizen leaders. Today, we're recommitting ourselves to that legacy as we work to make UVA the leading place in the world to study, teach, and engage with democracy. And Mr. Prime Minister, please know that we would love to have you back next year when you celebrate the 200th anniversary of the reintroduction of democracy in Greece. The third and final reason I'm excited to have the Prime Minister with us is personal. My family and I traveled to Greece several years ago and spent time in Athens and Antiparos and we absolutely fell in love with the people, the food, the scenery, the rhythm of life. And we had hoped to travel back maybe as early as this summer. But as I told my family today, given the travel difficulties, this is as close as our entire family will get to Greece this summer. That didn't go over especially well, but it was all I could offer. So I'm very much looking forward to the conversation this morning. And to lead it, we are honored to have General John Allen with us. In addition to running Brookings, one of the leading think tanks in the world, John is also an extraordinary public servant. A former four-star general in the Marine Corps, John directed the international fight against the Islamic State for over a year and has also commanded the NATO International Security Assistance Force as well as U.S. forces in Afghanistan. General Allen, thank you for your service and for working with us to bring the Prime Minister here. And Mr. Prime Minister, thank you very much for joining us. With that, I will turn it over to John and thank you again for being here. Jim, thank you very much for the very kind uh, introduction. It is wonderful to be sharing this day with the University of Virginia. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Brookings Institution, it is my pleasure uh, to welcome everyone to today and this discussion about Greece's successful management of the COVID-19 crisis and the challenges and the opportunities that lie ahead as the country is reopening to the world. We're deeply honored today to be joined by the Greek Prime Minister Prime Minister Kyriakos Mitsotakis, whose swift and bold action at the outset of this terrible health crisis and whose strong leadership have come to be deeply admired across the United States and around the world. Within 10 months of his election as the Prime Minister, he has managed to bring Greece to the fore as a global leader in decisive leadership and decisive governance and has helped to keep untold thousands safe and well in the process. Indeed, as the United States and several nations around the globe still battle COVID-19 as a pandemic, we turn to Greece for best practices and inspiration. Prime Minister Mitsotakis and his administration 
took rigorous, restrictive measures early on, trusting health experts to lead the effort, establishing honest and clear communications lines with the public, while at the same time strengthening the country's health care capacity and protecting vulnerable citizens. At the core of this effort was a commitment to the value of human life. Back in February, at the start of the crisis, the Prime Minister was clear to his cabinet that he was not concerned by the billions in GDP at risk due to the lockdown measures. Money can be recreated, he said, but we cannot bring back the lost lives. And for this brave approach and leadership, Mr. Prime Minister, we applaud you. And I will tell you that as a citizen of a country that has just passed 100,000 dead in this crisis, we certainly applaud heroic leadership while we see appalling leadership at work from time to time. Thank you, sir, for the example that you have set. Today's conversation will be moderated by Bill Antholis, who's the director and the CEO of the Miller Center at the University of Virginia, who served as the managing director at the Brookings Institution for a whole decade from 2004 to 2014 and maintains very close ties with Greece to this day. And Bill, it's wonderful to see you and by Amanda Sloat, who is the Robert Bosch Senior Fellow at our Center for US and Europe. She served as the Deputy Assistant Secretary of State from 2013 to 2016, and her portfolio included her responsibility for US relationship for the US relations with Greece, uh, Turkey, and Cyprus. In addition, over the past several weeks, Brookings has undertaken a major study on the challenges and the priorities for reopening America and the world which will officially launch tomorrow and be published in an ebook next month. Now, I'm proud to note that today's event is a prelude to that launch and is a part of our institutional commitment to reopening America and the world in the safest and most efficient way possible. Indeed, part of this wide ranging project also includes an analysis of how to responsibly open and Greece is an example seeing it reopen and its uh, reopening of its tourist sector as well, all the while reimagining travel and setting new health standards across the global community. And I think I speak for all of us here at, the Brook at Brookings when I say that after showing the world how it was successful in locking down against this crisis, we now look to Greece to show us the same in reopening. And finally to you, Mr. Prime Minister, your country is known for its hospitality, the legendary Philoxenia, literally translated as becoming friends with a stranger. And it would be our honor to show you Brookings' meaning of Philoxenia by hosting you in person at an event in our Falk Auditorium in 2021, as you commemorate the 200th anniversary of the modern birth of the Greek state. Uh, we hope that you'll consider it in the days to come. And when the world as a whole is opened, we are welcoming you to Washington. And briefly, as a final remember to those who are tuned in today, we're on the record and we're streaming live. So please send your questions in Zoom uh, or on Twitter to hashtag COVID reopening. And with that, it is my great pleasure to welcome Prime Minister Mitsotakis. And sir, the floor is yours. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, uh, General Allen. Thank you to um, um, UVA, the Miller Center. Thank you to Brookings for hosting me for what I hope is going to be an interesting uh, discussion. Um, I'm going to make some very brief introductory remarks uh, uh, about how we dealt with this unprecedented uh, crisis. And let me, let me start by referring to a comment that General Allen made that the world or the US is, is turning to Greece, I'm quoting, for best practices and inspiration. Just think about that and whether you would, in the context of what happened to Greece over the past 10 years, whether you would actually, how likely was it maybe six, 12 months, two years, three years ago to actually use that phrase for Greece? Uh, so I feel you know, particularly uh, proud that uh, we have used this crisis to actually change the image uh, of the country. And uh, indeed, it was probably unexpected for many people that we would do uh, well in handling COVID for reasons which should seem obvious to, to all of us. This is a country that it was just coming out of a 10-year crisis with um, a national health system that was put under a lot of pressure, 
with an older um, uh, population uh, and uh, a country which was perceived uh, as not uh, being uh, um, sort of very conducive to um, setting, uh, you know, big tasks and actually uh, achieving them. But we have managed to perform quite well overall. Uh, again, every loss of life is a tragedy, but uh, only 173 people perished in total in Greece um, from uh, the COVID uh, uh, epidemic. Uh, um, we have had over the past uh, you know, couple of weeks, only a handful of new cases per day. We have succeeded in essentially eliminating uh, community um, uh, transmission. We have less than 20 people in, uh, in intensive care. So for, for all effective purposes, we consider that we have managed to dodge the bullet and contain the first wave of the, uh, of the outbreak uh, of the pandemic. How do we do it? Four points. Uh, in retrospect, with hindsight, they may seem rather obvious. Trust me, that was not the case when we actually took those uh, decisions. The first, take your decisions very early. It was obvious to me after consulting with our public health expert that we would be moving into some sort of lockdown. It was inevitable in my mind that it would happen. And I took the decision to um, do it early rather than late. And I think it was clearly the right decision. You know, our models tell us uh, are, that had we delayed even by a week or a couple of weeks, the trajectory of the epidemic would have been completely, uh, completely different. So we took decisions very early. Just to give you one example, uh, we decided uh, not to have our annual carnival celebrations in the third largest city in Greece, in Patras, even before we had the first COVID case in Greece. We were just looking at what was happening uh, in Italy uh, at the time. And uh, there were a lot of people who were critical when we took the decisions citing the uh, you know, dramatic economic impact. But uh, um, it was sort of obvious to me uh, at the time what is probably even more obvious now that there is no uh, inverse relationship between taking drastic measures uh, and, and suffering you know, a very, uh, a very you know, um, deep recession. If, if anything, uh, what, we, uh, what we see now is that the countries that have done better in containing uh, the epidemic and those are invariably the countries that took uh, measures earlier may actually be uh, in a better position to to recover faster. Still, the, the jury is still out on that, but that is my expectation of what will happen. The second thing that we did is we communicated very clearly and tried to build uh, trust uh, amongst the, the, the Greek population. I didn't do uh, any daily uh, press briefings. I outsourced the communication job to our uh, top uh, um, uh, epidemiologist and our, the head of our civil protection uh, um, uh, agency. And we essentially tried to convince people that it was the right thing to do to stay at home and to follow you know, the basic rules of social distancing. And uh, surprisingly, uh, Greeks followed uh, our, our advice. Uh, and uh, of course, there were you know, fines uh, for people breaking lockdown, but this was not a coercive exercise. It was an uh, exercise uh, in... Uh, um, in collective uh, uh, behavior for the common good. Uh, and it was very surprising to many that Greeks, which were considered to be very, as Bill knows quite well, or other independent uh, and not following, and not very prone to actually sticking to rules, actually um, obeyed the basic guidelines. Uh, and uh, this is a collective success. Uh, and I am very grateful to the Greek population for actually doing what the experts told them would be right to do for them. Uh, and eventually for all of us. I think the, th the, uh, the third thing that we did is we very quickly strengthened our national health service. So we repurposed uh, you know, hospital beds. We essentially doubled the number of, uh, uh, of ICU units within, within weeks. We managed to get enough uh, personal protective equipment to cover all our healthcare needs. Uh, and that gave uh, uh, also our healthcare uh, personnel the additional um, uh, comfort uh, that they were being looked after, and they did a fantastic job. Uh, we didn't lose a single healthcare professional from COVID, and we had very, very few uh, infections within our hospitals. So we managed uh, to, to protect uh, our national um, health system uh, in a rather effective way. And the, the last thing we did very well, I think, was to protect the more vulnerable. From, from day one, we said that we got to protect our uh, uh, our elderly population. And because in Greece, you know, we have families, three generations that frequently live together. 
we made we made a very very clear case to make sure that our message was communicated very clearly to the more um, vulnerable uh, parts of our population uh, people with uh, underlying health conditions but in particular uh, our older population uh, and uh, we also managed to to protect uh, uh, our um, um, uh, nursing homes we didn't have a single uh, fatality uh, in publicly run nursing um, uh, um, uh, facilities uh, for elderly uh, care centers uh, in the country so we managed to to protect uh, uh, the elderly population rather uh, successfully. Of course, uh, it is it is very good to receive the sort of international acknowledgement um, uh, regarding our uh, handling of the crisis. But we acknowledge that the difficult task is still um, uh, is still ahead of us. Uh, reopening, we've said from the very beginning, is much more complicated than actually closing down the economy. We have started um, reopening the economy. Uh, since May 4th, when we actually lifted the horizontal lockdown, we've done it very progressively. We're monitoring new cases very, very uh, closely. We haven't seen any spike in the new cases uh, after we have uh, started to, uh, to open up the economy. Of course, the weather is helping us because we are primarily outdoors. So we're encouraging people to actually be outdoors. And we are asking them to be much more vigilant when they are uh, indoors. Uh, we've uh, made masks mandatory on public transport. Uh, we've made masks mandatory um, uh, 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 in the hospitality sector, in the food sector, um, uh, for people actually working uh, in these um, uh, in these businesses. So we want to make sure that the, the basic rules that we put in place, which is social distancing, personal hygiene, and masks whenever they are uh, required, uh, are, are are being respected uh, by the population. One risk which I see is to be a victim of our own success uh, in the sense that people do become more complacent. And it's only natural after two and a half months that uh, people are, you know, are happy about our success and then they tend to forget about uh, the basic uh, rules of social distancing. So um, we need to remind them constantly that we have not eliminated the virus. The virus is still here. Uh, we expect uh, the transmission rates to be much lower during the summer. But people still need to be vigilant and, and they need to be uh, and they need to be careful. Uh, and of course, the most difficult, the most complicated challenge in opening up, and I'm sure we'll discuss this uh, in the Q&A part uh, of the discussion, has to do with how do you open up to foreign travelers? How do you gradually open up your tourism sector? How do we make sure we salvage something out of our tourism season? Because Greece is very dependent on tourism for its, uh, um, uh, its almost 20% of our, uh, of our economy. Uh, and uh, how do we make sure that people uh, who travel to Greece do so safely, uh, have a, still have a great experience uh, and don't contribute to any new outbreak uh, of the virus? This is a complicated exercise. I'm you know, happy to talk about it uh, in more detail during the Q&A session. But I think we've, we've thought it out uh, in a lot of uh, detail. Uh, and I do expect... Uh, to be able to, to welcome tourism uh, and tourists as of uh, uh, July 1st um, uh, to Greece, uh, uh, based again on the pattern that we will put in place regarding which countries we will um, uh, open up to first. So uh, let me stop uh, uh, here and um, uh, 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 pass it back to uh, Amanda uh, and Bill for, uh, for questions. Again, uh, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to participate in this discussion. I thank you very much, Prime Minister, for those helpful uh, opening comments. Um, and I certainly congratulate you on the great success that your country has had in, in containing the pandemic. Uh, as somebody who has worked on Greece for a number of years, I will put myself in the category of people you mentioned that were surprised by the high degree of, of Greek compliance with a lot of the rules that the, the government put into place. Uh, so in addition to the, the government measures, I am curious why you think there was such a high degree of compliance, if there had been lessons learned from the past. And relatedly, I know that Greece followed some other European countries in terms of some of the tracking mechanisms, the self-reporting uh, of, of citizens who had, had gone out, uh, and was curious how you see this broader debate that a lot of countries are having about managing public health versus civil liberties in terms of, of some of these surveillance and, and health debates uh, and how you think that factored into the, the broader compliance issue. 
I think we were able to um, convince people to do the right thing because we we communicated from the very beginning very, very uh, clearly, and we used uh, people who actually have a lot of credibility or build a lot of credibility during this um, uh, exercise. Uh, after you know, 10 years of crisis, as you know, uh, there was uh, uh, you know, a tendency to um, distrust uh, experts, technocrats, this is one of the characteristics of countries that go through a populist phase. And it was very refreshing and encouraging to see that people actually trusted the experts uh, during this, uh, uh, this crisis. Uh, and uh, a lot of our success is, is due to the persuasive powers of our chief epidemiologist who went on TV every day at six o'clock every afternoon uh, you know, to the minute uh, to explain to people what exactly was happening. Uh, and um, convince them why they needed to to stay at home. Essentially, it was a it was an educating, a very interesting collective educating experiment, uh, which worked rather well. I think also people looked at what was happening in uh, in Italy, and obviously they were uh, they were scared. So at least we had the, the benefit uh, of having a, a country that went through this crisis probably you know three weeks uh, before us. Uh, and at the same time, uh, I think they were. Uh, looking and expecting um, the sort of leadership that we um, uh, provided, uh, and uh, the the real debate as to whether um, uh, we had uh, you know a restriction in our civil liberties versus you know protecting public health was not really uh, never really became part of the public um, the debate. People uh, understood that what we did was very much within um, the the spirit. Uh, but also between the text of our, of, of our constitution, that we did it in order to, to protect uh, um, the life of our citizens, which is the, the foremost obligation uh, of, uh, of any state. So there was never any real debate or any real questioning as to whether we did the right thing. Uh, you know, when we were polling during the times of the crisis, 80% of the people thought that the measures were necessary uh, and they were actually happy that we took them. And there were even times when people actually were asking us to be to be even stricter um, because they they were actually seeing what was happening elsewhere and they were expecting the government to actually put in place a proper framework um, to protect our citizens now we didn't we didn't use um, uh, uh, we didn't we didn't broadly use any sort of tracing contact apps um, we looked at other countries we weren't actually convinced that these uh, work very uh, effectively. So, but what we did use uh, uh, was a very, I think, efficient contact tracing system. Once we tested, once we identified people who tested positive for COVID, you can do that uh, as long as the numbers are relatively low. I think we did it very well, uh, and we have a very, we still have a very thorough uh, database of all our COVID cases, where they are who have we placed in quarantines, where their contacts are. So we managed to do the contact tracing part um, um, uh, very well. Uh, but of course, um, you cannot do that uh, if, uh, if uh, the outbreak uh, passes a, a certain threshold uh, and if you reach uh, uh, you know, a high degree of community transmission. Because we acted very quickly, we could do the contact tracing, which helped us uh, suppress the epidemic during its uh, early stage. But what is also interesting and, and remarkable uh, is that after many, many years, people place their trust again in the state. Uh, you know, I, since I ever rem remember myself, there was always this uh, uh, skepticism about the ability of the state, the Greek state, to perform basic functions. This actually was a trend that was uh, was here even before um, uh, uh, the 10 year crisis. For the first time, we didn't hear what we usually hear in Greece during any crisis. What is the state doing to protect me? Uh, and uh, this trust, it's an, almost a repository of trust that we've been able to, um, uh, to build, uh, is actually gonna be very helpful as we move into the next phase. And of course, the next phase is to make sure that uh, we, we don't face a very deep recession and that we have a very quick recovery. In, uh, in 2021, but when you look at you know all uh, you know all advanced economies, all advanced societies, this element of social trust is very important. We had lost it in Greece for many years, 
and the pandemic was uh, an opportunity out of the blue to rediscover it. And I intend to make sure that uh, uh, this legacy, this positive legacy is well preserved because it will serve us very well uh, as we move forward. Uh, Mr. Prime Minister, again, thanks for joining us. I, I want to stick with exactly the point you were talking about, trust in the state, trust in the public health officials, um, and, and make it a bit personal. We've studied presidential first years in the United States where leaders are empowered by their publics, but they're also new at the job and don't necessarily know the career officials around them. We've seen in the United States varying degrees, both at the national and at the state level to which politicians are willing to trust not just public health officials, but other public authorities that have to implement some of the measures. Can you describe the process and, and when it started, sort of late January, early February, what were you hearing, what were you seeing, and how did you manage or allow those officials within the uh, career government um, or public health authorities to step forward. Can you describe the internal processes and decision making that uh, that led you and the government? Well, first of all, I got elected in July of last year with a mandate to reform the economy uh, and bring Greece back onto a growth track. And I was certainly not expecting to be faced with uh, with a big healthcare crisis, I need to point out that right before COVID you know, struck uh, Greece, we had also faced a very important challenge uh, on our borders with Turkey. We may discuss this um, later when we essentially were faced with an influx of, uh, of refugees and, and migrants, uh, a very conscious and systematic attempt by Turkey to push desperate people across the Greek borders. And that was also a, a very important geopolitical crisis, which I think we handled rather well. And then on top of that, we had to deal with, with the COVID uh, pandemic. So we immediately went into sort of crisis mode. And one, one good thing about Greece is we are not a federal state, so we are relatively centralized. When we take decisions, we can implement them very quickly. Uh, we have an absolute majority in parliament, so there's no, no, no discussion with coalition partners. And speed is of essence uh, when you have to deal with these types of crises. So we make a decision, you know, one day we implement it uh, the day uh, after. If you compare, for example, Greece to, to Spain, uh, um, Spain is a more federal state. You have to, you, you have to talk to all the regional uh, governors, if you also have to have a coalition partner, that makes it even more complicated. And if you lose, you know, a couple of weeks, it may be the difference between success and, and failure. So um, the fact that we had a strong mandate and an absolute majority uh, certainly helped uh, in, in dealing with, uh, uh, with the crisis. Um, in terms of, uh, of, of trusting, you know, the, uh, the public administration and, uh, and the experts, uh, Personally, I did not know uh, our chief epidemiologist, although he's also a Harvard graduate. I had never met him. I had heard about him, uh, but uh, you know, I, 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 met to, I met him, I, I spoke to him. He convinced me immediately that he knew what he was talking about. And it was a very easy decision for me to ask him to do not just the, um, uh, the background work uh, and the strategic thinking, but also um, you know, take over uh, the, the public communication. And I think it was, it was certainly uh, the, the right decision uh, to take uh, at, uh, at the time. And, and, you know, Bill, this is a very, you know, sometimes the Greek public administration in the past has become rather, you know, politicized. Uh, we made it very clear that, you know, this is a national crisis. We're looking to unite the country. Uh, I don't care what people voted for, um, um, uh, whether they voted for La Democratia, for Syriza, or for whatever other party. I, I expect them to do a job. I expect them to cooperate uh, and uh, to try to um, uh, address a very, very complicated um, uh, problem. So there were no partisan lines uh, drawn uh, uh, during this uh, crisis. We, um, you know, the, uh, we didn't receive any, you know, the opposition was relatively, I would say, during, at least in during the first stages, relatively supportive. After that, they started, you know, the usual um, uh, criticism. Uh, but uh, overall, uh, I tried to communicate a message of, uh, uh, of unity. Uh, and what is, uh, what, what is interesting is that a lot of people actually took lots of initiatives during this crisis. This is a very hierarchical bureaucracy, but 
when I usually, I was in, um, this is a hospital yesterday, and I was surprised by how people told me, you know, how many initiatives they took at the hospital level, how they cooperated, uh, how they felt that uh, their voices were actually heard um, by the by the leadership, and how how you know their needs were um, uh, were addressed. So uh, uh, it's difficult to build uh, trust, uh, and very easy to uh, to destroy it. Uh, but at the end of the day, you have to trust people. Um, uh, uh, who have the CV to uh, and have proven that they're capable uh, of doing the job, give them a, a very clear task and then hope that they deliver. And in our case, they did. I wanted to shift the discussion to some of the economic recovery piece. Uh, General Allen, in his opening remarks, praised your initial focus on preserving human life, which you've certainly succeeded at. Uh, and now, of course, your government faces the daunting challenge of dealing with some of the economic fallout from the pandemic. Uh, predictions seem to suggest that you could experience a 5 to 10 percent recession this year, uh, but you've been quite bullish in your public comments about expecting the economy to uh, bounce back next year. Uh, could you speak a little bit about what you're intending to do on the economic recovery side, uh, including questions about how you'll uh, attract some foreign direct investment and, and also how you see the tourism sector helping with that? First of all, we have already done a lot. Uh, we've put forward a, a total package uh, that is close to 24 billion euros, um, 14 billion in fiscal measures, 10 billion uh, in, uh, in guarantees um, to help uh, support companies uh, with their liquidity um, um, uh, problems. And this is probably the biggest you know, package that the Greek state has ever put forward uh, in, uh, in supporting the country during a time of, uh, of crisis. And of course, uh, Europe has helped us uh, on that front uh, in the sense that we are no longer bound by the very restrictive uh, um, preconditions regarding our primary surplus that were put in place uh, by the previous government. So we are essentially allowed to run a deficit for, uh, for uh, 2020. The ECB has helped uh, in the sense that it has uh, um, uh, for the first time accepted uh, the purchase of, of Greek bonds uh, as part of its uh, uh, asset purchase program. Uh, and uh, we have moved, we moved very, very quickly um, uh, to protect jobs uh, and to make sure that we support the income of those um, uh, whose employment was temporarily suspended. Uh, so the, the package that we've put in place uh, is, uh, is certainly big by uh, our standards, but not uh, outside the scope of what we can deal with from a fiscal point of view, because we're always, obviously we're a country that has a very high debt to GDP ratio. So we wanna spend money to support the economy, but we're always conscious of the fact that we cannot afford to derail our uh, long-term fiscal stability. And I think we have be been able to strike the right balance, at least that's what the markets and the international rating agencies um, uh, seem, to, uh, seem to believe. And again, our number one priority was to protect uh, employment, uh, to support the income uh, of those uh, workers uh, uh, who were essentially, um, whose companies were left uh, without any uh, revenue during the time uh, uh, of the crisis. Of course, the big challenge is, uh, is tourism, as you said. I still don't know exactly what is going to happen and how many people will come to Greece. We want to make sure that they do come to Greece, but they come uh, in a safe manner. So we will gradually open up Greece to foreign travelers. We will start by countries that have similar epidemiological uh, data um, uh, with, uh, with Greece, and we expect to gradually ramp up direct flights to our uh, islands uh, as of July 1st. So um, uh, we, we do expect some tourism, uh, uh, but uh, of course we know we will take a big hit. Uh, of course, we're not alone uh, in this effort. Uh, I'm sure you're aware of the fact that um, the European Commission today uh, announced a very ambitious um, uh, program, uh, what we call the Recovery Fund, um, which is uh, a, uh, a very big 750 billion uh, program. That is at least a proposal of the Commission, out of which 500 billion is gonna be direct grants to countries that uh, uh, are, uh, have suffered the most uh, as, a, as a result of this crisis. And Greece is going to be a big beneficiary. Uh, and I don't know the exact uh, amount of money that we will receive. This is going to be announced tomorrow. And of course, there are still complicated negotiations at the level of the Council. But we expect a significant support by the European Union to overcome this crisis. Uh, so uh, I am cautiously 
optimistic that we have taken uh, the right uh, measures uh, to absorb as much as possible the initial uh, shock. But of course, the challenge, you know, come September, will be to put Greece back to a growth track. Uh, and our main agenda, which was an agenda that Greece is an attractive destination for foreign investment, uh, is as valid today as it was um, um, six months ago. Uh, we've gone out of our way to attract um, uh, foreign investment in Greece. And we were doing extremely well before COVID um, uh, struck us. So uh, for long-term investors who look at the fundamentals of the country, this is a country that is coming out of a, you know, a 10-year crisis with what I believe is a, is, is a credible leadership that is reform-oriented, that can guarantee political stability for the foreseeable future, that is relatively uh, cheap, that has many natural comparative advantages uh, in tourism and renewable uh, energy, uh, in, in services. Uh, so this is a country that is already uh, attracting a lot of interest by long-term investors. And we certainly intend to build upon uh, the good image of the country in dealing with uh, the pandemic in attracting more foreign investment. Let me just give you one example. Uh, we're big believers that um, um, uh, Greece could benefit greatly from what we call, you know, the silver economy. Uh, if someone wants to, uh, you know, had second thoughts about buying a house in Greece, uh, you know, a retiree um, from, uh, from Europe who would like to spend their summers or maybe their winters uh, in Greece, and they had second thoughts because they were not sure that, you know, our public health system was up to the task. Well, we've certainly answered uh, that uh, question. And at a time when people have realized that they can work uh, from, from anywhere, why wouldn't they choose to work from a very nice location? So this whole concept of what it means to actually spend time in a, in a nice and safe place, I think certainly enhances uh, Greece's credentials uh, when it comes to this important segment uh, of the market. And we will continue, of course, with our reform um, program to, to make Greece more friendly to investors. We are very big uh, on, our, on our green agenda. Uh, Greece is a natural, has a natural comparative advantage when it comes to renewable uh, energy, uh, unlimited access to wind uh, and, uh, and solar power. We've made very bold announcements that we want to move away from um, coal-fired uh, electricity production by 2023. So we're shutting uh, all our lignite plants, uh, uh, bar one by then. Uh, and there is going to be even more money now available uh, from the European Union to support this transition. Uh, towards a, a green economy. And of course, the, uh, the comment that uh, uh, General Allen made in his introductory remarks is, is very, very relevant. How do you reimagine tourism uh, after COVID? We want to focus more on quality and less on quantity. We want to do it in a way that we actually protect uh, our unique uh, environmental and cultural heritage. So this no longer is a game of numbers. We're always looking at, you know, the number of people who come to Greece, you know, 30 million, 35 million. But it's not just about number. It's about income. It's about attracting the right um, uh, people, those who can actually spend more money. And, and in that sense, I think COVID is going to help us sort of refocus our priorities uh, even with that, within that segment. You can actually um, 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 do more or get more with less number of people coming to, uh, coming to Greece. So there is going to be a, a big focus uh, on, on quality, uh, on sustainability uh, after COVID. Uh, this was already our direction, but we have every reason to make sure we uh, accelerate the measures that take us down that path. I'd love to follow up with um, a couple of questions around tourism and come back to the EU questions where I know we'll, we'll want to talk about a range of issues in Europe, but, um, and also start bringing in questions from the audience. Uh, we have a number of questions, in, including from Greek Americans. The National Hellenic Society is supporting today's event and has uh, invited its members to this. And I know a lot of Greek Americans want to know, will Americans be able to travel to Greece? Um, uh, we, we are not a leading country in, in lowering uh, COVID infections and deaths. Um, and I know Greece's initial plans were targeting countries in Europe that have done a good job. What are your thoughts there? But then also a lot of questions about communicating um, both to the public and to uh, the Greek public as well as to tourists about the various measures. How do you see the role of the media? Um, so I, I wonder if you'd tackle both of those for us, Mr. Yeah. Well, um, 
the honest answer regarding your first point is I still don't know because we're looking at, uh, at data from, uh, from all countries. Yes, the U.S. has not done, uh, is it, still further behind the curve in terms of containing the outbreak. And we've got to be very honest here. There is no way to massively test people when they get to the country. And there's also no protocol for testing people before they get on a plane. Uh, uh, right now, because we have a limited number of flights arriving, we're testing everyone who's coming to Greece. And we're putting them in a, uh, in a hotel for a day until the test comes out. If the test is, is negative, they're, they're, they're fine. Of course, if it's positive, then they have to, um, uh, then, they have to then we'll put them in a, in a quarantine. Um, uh, so far, we haven't had, uh, we've tested um, uh, more than 1,500 people over the past uh, days. Uh, flights coming in from Europe, uh, we haven't had a single positive uh, case. So this is encouraging in terms of what will happen once we open to a European destination. But we need, we need to look at the data and hopefully the US is going to do much better uh, and uh, it's going to succeed in flattening the, uh, the curve. But it is unlikely that they will be on our July 1st uh, list given the, the data that we, that we currently have. And I guess, and again, this, this, is very, this refers to, um, uh, to direct flights from, uh, from, from the U.S., not to flights that come from, uh, from Germany or from, um, uh, from France or from other European countries where we would have already uh, opened um, uh, flights. So it is, a, it is a very complicated task, but we want to make sure that people come, that they're safe, and that uh, we won't have a second outbreak um, uh, during uh, the summer. Now, as far as the role of... of media is concerned. I think that uh, overall we ran a government-sponsored campaign um, regarding COVID with, I think, very, uh, so very succinct messaging. But I think overall media was helpful. Uh, and, you know, all the talk shows uh, and uh, mo I'd say the overwhelming majority of journalists actually supported our message. So there was no real dissent uh, 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 or no polarization uh, in terms of whether we're doing the right thing. Everybody thought we were doing the right thing. Very, very few uh, exceptions. No cultural wars, uh, no issues regarding, you know, face masks, whether the, you know, we should or we shouldn't be, be wearing them. So I think overall media was, was quite supportive. Uh, I think they, you know, sometimes, you know, some over-exaggeration as you would uh, expect, uh, some unnecessary drama. But overall, I'd say that Greek media was rather responsible both newspapers and uh, you know the big uh, you know um, uh, TV shows uh, in uh, in supporting our efforts, we we went out of our way to make sure that we briefed them and that we briefed uh, journalists as to what we what we wanted to do. Uh, but we we succeeded uh, in in making this uh, a collective exercise that you know transcended party lines. So it wasn't it didn't become uh, you know our response never became very political. <laughs> Let me ask a quick follow up there um, with Italy being so clear, and a way of bringing it back to the European questions, Italy being so close to Greece, um, you know, for people who have traveled in Greece, regular transport between Patras and, uh, and the western coast of Italy, um, the, um, but the, and the Italian economy being so important to the Greek economy, one of your biggest trading partners, um, how do you see that moving forward? If Italy's economy um, is slow to recover or even moves toward collapse, how will that affect Greece? Give us a little bit of thought there and then we can broaden the conversation to your neighbors to the east. Well, um, uh, right now there is no, uh, the, the ferry services between Greece and Italy is, um, is just limited to trade, just trucks. Um, and we have no direct flights between Greece and Italy. And we're looking very carefully at, at Italy and we will open up to Italy when we're comfortable that uh, they've managed to, to you know, contain uh, the epidemic to a point which is gonna be acceptable to us. I hope this is gonna happen because there's a general trend in Europe that uh, um, uh, the, the epidemic is being contained. Uh, maybe the UK is, is further uh, behind the, uh, you know, the path, but Italy, has already gone through a lot of uh, a lot of pain, and thank God they're doing uh, much better. But this is a situation that is really changing uh, on a, on a weekly basis. Of course, Greece is uh, uh, is dependent on Italy. Italy, to a certain extent, uh, is dependent on Greece, and we're all dependent on the single market. Uh, and it's very important to preserve the single market um, uh, during this uh, uh, this crisis. But what is what is interesting is that uh, countries. Uh, 
I look at the Sweden versus, for example, Denmark paradigm. Um, Sweden took a more quote unquote relaxed approach. Uh, I'm not gonna judge it from a, a, a public health point of view, but if you look at the projections regarding the economy, it's still gonna be suffering a very big recession. Um, so in a interconnected um, a world, um, uh, there, is, there is really, um, even if you keep your economy functioning, even if you don't go into a full lockdown, you will uh, pay, the, uh, pay the price. And uh, I think that the countries that succeeded in, in, contain, in containing the epidemic are also the ones that are opening up faster um, uh, and hence have a chance of staging a quicker recovery. So that's why I think the better you do on the healthcare side, the quicker the recovery is going to be. And I know there's some anecdotal evidence uh, you know, from the US, from cities during the 1918-19 um, um, uh, Spanish flu outbreak that seemed to support uh, this um, uh, trend. Uh, and of course, I'll get back to the European question, because uh, this is not a crisis that we can overcome without a big bazookas. Uh, and I think what uh, uh, the Commission has proposed is big. What the ECB has done is big. So if you put the two together and if the European Union is finally moves towards a joint issuance of debt even at the level of the Commission to fund a program that is focused primarily on grants and not loans this will be a huge step for the European Union to actually demonstrate um, uh, solidarity in a very tangible manner and help us all uh, absorb the crisis because at the end of the day even the countries that are hesitant and skeptical about whether we should go down that path they are very much dependent on the single market probably more so than, uh, than we are. They're smaller, open uh, economies. So if the single market were to collapse for whatever reason, they would pay a very, very, very big price. So it's, it's our point to make the case that what, what we are proposing, what the Commission is proposing, is not just good for us, it's good for Europe. For, it's good for the European project as, as a whole. And you know that Europe has never moved forward in a, in a completely linear manner. There are periods of, uh, you know, of, paralysis and then sort of a great leap forward. Maybe this is an opportunity, uh, and I'm, I, I hope it is an opportunity to do something really bold that sort of reinvigorates the whole um, uh, European project. In addition to tourists coming to Greece, you also have a large number of refugees and migrants who have been coming to Greece, are currently in camps on the islands and, and may continue to come in the future. Uh, we'd alluded a, a bit to the situation you had back in February when Turkey was, was removing some of the restrictions on people's ability to travel. Uh, and the Turkish foreign minister this week suggested that refugees may wanna resume moving once the lockdown in both countries continues. Uh, at the same time, there have been criticisms of the way the Greek government has handled some aspects of the refugee crisis in terms of some conditions in the camp, some policing, uh, the decision by the government to suspend asylum applications in, in March. Uh, could you talk a bit about how you're seeing the, the refugee crisis in terms of things that the government has been doing to deal with the refugee situation in light of the coronavirus pandemic, uh, and also how you're seeing this in broader terms with, with Turkey, uh, including the, the comment that Commission President van der Leyen had made about seeing Greece as, as the shield of, of Europe and whether that is a role that Greece wants to play or whether there is more that you want the EU to be doing to help at this stage? Well, I, I'd probably say that, you know, um, removing restrictions on, on movement of people is probably not a very accurate way of portraying what exactly happened during the first weekend of March. It was a very systematic attempt by Turkey to encourage desperate people to cross the border. Turkey always sort of blackmailed Europe uh, and was telling Europe that if you don't help me with your refugee problem, with my refugee problem, which is also your refugee problem, I will send hundreds of thousands of people uh, across the Greek border uh, into Europe. And this is exactly what Turkey tried to do. So let's be honest here and let's just describe the situation as it, as it was. And what Greece said, we said, no, this is not gonna happen. So we protected our, our border with full uh, you know, full respect for um, for human uh, for human life, but uh, we had an obligation during those very difficult days to make sure that we would not tolerate this sort of massive illegal crossing of death of desperate people uh, into uh, into Greece. Uh, and not only did we do it, we did it successfully, 
and we did it with the full support of the European Union. Um, three days after we put in place this policy, the leadership of the European Union uh, joined me uh, on the Greek-Turkish border to make a point that Europe has every right to protect its borders, that it will support Greece uh, in doing so. And in that context, Ursula von der Leyen made the comment that Greece was the, the shield of, of Europe, which in my mind is a, very, uh, is a very valid comment. Now, we've been very, very open and I've been very open from the beginning in making the case that Turkey needs to be supported with its own refugee problem. And I should remind you that we've had a statement in place um, between the European Union and Turkey since 2016, which for two and a half years worked relatively well. Uh, it was a, a statement that took into consideration uh, concerns, both you know, Greek concerns, European concerns, and Turkish concerns. And on some, at some point, it started, it stopped working. And it stopped working because I think that Turkey encouraged um, uh, uh, more, uh, more people uh, to, um, to cross into, uh, into Greece. And I think now that we've sort of closed this chapter, it is a very good opportunity to honestly engage uh, with Turkey, but not under conditions of, uh, of blackmail um, or of you know, this, this type of pressure. Uh, and uh, uh, there are a lot of things to discuss with Turkey. We're very, very open. And we've, we've said that we would like to help uh, in a discussion between the European Union uh, and, and Turkey as to how we will improve the statement, the agreement between the European Union and Turkey. Uh, the, Europe has supported Turkey with significant amount of money and should probably continue to do so. So there's a win-win um, solution here for everyone, but not under uh, conditions that we faced uh, in, in March. So we made it very clear that under these conditions, uh, the only thing um, that we could do is to make sure that we protect our borders. And this is something that we will continue to do, both, um, uh, both our land borders and our sea borders. Uh, and we've seen uh, very limited numbers of people actually crossing um, uh, the Aegean. Uh, and uh, this is something which I think is encouraging because one should not forget that these people are victims. Uh, they're victims of smugglers. You know, frequently they, they promise them, you know, safe passage uh, uh, into, uh, into Greece and they spend a lot of money paying the smugglers um, uh, to actually get to, uh, get to Greece uh, only to realize that they will not succeed uh, in their uh, in their task, uh, uh, and um, we should uh, you know, um, realize that, uh, uh, and I think everyone is realizing that this government is doing things differently when it comes to border management than the previous uh, uh, government, and it is also doing it uh, with the full support of uh, the European Union. Uh, Mr. Prime Minister, you mentioned before that the European Union has an opportunity in a in a crisis. Uh, to take a great leap forward. Um, but, you know, there are also effects of a crisis that weaken countries um, economically. And I'm thinking not just about Turkey here, but about countries like China, where as the crisis unfolds and their economies continue to suffer, they may use the opportunity to divert attention or um, to use distractions in the world. Um, to do provocative actions. And I'm just curious how you are thinking about that, not just with your neighbor to the east um, and other places to the east that are unstable, but also with respect to China. Are you concerned about China, Turkey, um, other countries that have sometimes been constructive and with which you've wanted to have constructive partnerships, but have also acted, have acted aggressively in the past? How much are you thinking on the security side about those kinds of uh, challenges? Well, first of all, vis-a-vis -vis Turkey, let me just point out that we'd like to have an open and constructive relationship with Turkey. We're destined by geography to live side by side. And we should be able to, to engage uh, and to openly talk, not necessarily agree on all our differences because we have big differences, but certainly ease the tension uh, in, in our um, um, uh, relationship. Uh, and I'm always open to engage under these conditions in an open and constructive dialogue with, um, uh, with Turkey. Uh, and uh, it's also, I think, to, to the benefit of Turkey not to distance itself completely uh, from the European Union. One should not forget that the EU is Turkey's biggest uh, uh, trading partner. Now, as far as China is, uh, is concerned, we've, we, I think we've had an honest relationship um, uh, with, uh, with China. China uh, actually did invest in Greece at a time when many other countries considered Greece to be completely uninvestable. 
They have one big investment, which is the Port of Piraeus, which has been a relatively successful investment from, from our point of view, has created lots of jobs and has helped Piraeus become uh, one of the biggest uh, ports uh, in the Mediterranean. But we're not overly dependent uh, on Chinese um, uh, investment. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, our relationship with China is always viewed within the context of the broader relationship that the EU has uh, with China. So we have um, a good working economic relationship uh, with China. Again, we are open for investment. Uh, we would like to have as diversified a source of foreign investment as possible. China is one of the countries um, that has taken an interest in Greece. Hopefully, there'll be, uh, there'll be many more who would be interested in investing in Greece. Can I ask on, on the, as a follow up to the investing in Greece question, uh, one of the, the questions that's come in from, from somebody watching this has been commenting on the reverse brain drain that we've seen, that over the last decade during the financial crisis, you had a large number of Greeks who were leaving in, in, in search of, of opportunities elsewhere, uh, but that you have seen people returning within the last couple of months, given the, the government's handling of the, the crisis. Uh, is this something that the government is, is hoping to capitalize on, I especially in, in biotech industry and, and other places. And, and do you see this as a, a longer term trend? I would certainly hope that it's a longer uh, term trend. Uh, I've made a big point of trying to convince uh, the hundreds of thousands of young Greeks who, um, uh, who left Greece during the crisis to give their home country a second chance. It was not always easy because there was a lack of trust um, and a belief that in, in Greece things don't, don't, don't happen don't happen in a particularly meritocratic way. Uh, and I think the way we've handled the COVID crisis has, has helped change perceptions also amongst the Greek diaspora. And I'm also picking up what you described, you know, a, a real interest by many people to actually reconsider moving back to Greece. But of course, they will only move back to Greece if there are good jobs in Greece. Most people left because the jobs were not here. So job creation and high quality job creation uh, is certainly uh, our number one priority. And if they also believe in the long-term prospects of the country, then you have the basic ingredients uh, of convincing um, uh, people to actually return to Greece. And we need their talent, because if Greece is going to grow again, this is not just a question of, of capital, it's also a question of human capital. And these are people who took risks, are well-educated, uh, have bring they would bring back to Greece tremendous experience. Uh, and I think this is also one of the reasons why many companies are looking to invest in Greece. It's not just, uh, you know, the sun and the sea and the lovely weather and the fact that Greek assets are cheap. It's a human capital of the country, highly educated labor force, but also the ability to attract talent from abroad. Let me give you just one example. Pfizer has announced that they're setting up a big uh, R&D center, not in Athens, in Thessaloniki, the second largest Greek city. Why? Because they realize that Thessaloniki is a huge university town. They can get access to you know, graduates with a technical background uh, or with a biotech background uh, very easily uh, at a very, at what they consider to be a competitive uh, salary. So um, uh, one of the reasons why companies would invest in Greece is, uh, is, is the human capital. And the human capital is currently both in Greece, but also outside Greece. Uh, and uh, um, one of the reasons why one would return to Greece under these circumstances is the belief that they can find a, a good paying job with a promising career uh, in their homeland. And as we all know, all of us who've lived abroad for many years, and I'm sure maybe quite a few of, of, of Greeks are tuned in uh, our session, there is um, this Greek word, which is called nostos. Nostos is a Greek word, which is sort of the, the longing to actually return to your, um, uh, your home country. So we all eventually want to come back. Uh, the questions, my job is to make sure that the conditions are in place for people to actually be able to make that choice. They will not all return. We live in a globalized world, but I want them to at least have the choice to return. Mr. Prime Minister, we're at the end of the hour, but I, I wonder if you'd let us ask one more question to help sort of wrap things up. Sure. Um, you're the head of the new democracy party. Um, our president at UVA mentioned democracy being very important to us here at the university, given the connection to Thomas Jefferson. But obviously here in the United States, we, we take the issue seriously. And I'm just wondering your thoughts about what the crisis has taught you about democracy, not just in Greece, but across Europe and even here in the United States. Um, 
uh, how you do, how do you see democracy moving forward in your own country and across Europe? And then, you know, frankly, given the polarization and the political um, fighting and anger that's hit in the United States, including about re uh, responding to the pandemic, how do you see uh, European, American, Greek American relations moving forward, particularly when democracy seems to be a contested ground rather than a common ground? Well, first of all, on your second question, I think Greek American relations are excellent right now, and they, I think they, they transcend the, the current circumstance. Uh, this is a strategic relationship for, for Greece. I think I'm sure it's also a strategic relationship for the US in a, in a difficult part of the world. You know, Greece is, uh, is a pillar of, uh, of stability and continuity, and I'm sure this is something which is very important uh, for uh, the United States on many, uh, on many fronts. I think this is a very strong uh, relationship, made only stronger by the fact that we have a very sort of solid uh, sort of Greek uh, American uh, community and uh, of course uh, um, uh, we're also um, uh, a predictable ally in the good sense uh, of, 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 of the term uh, uh, and there, there isn't much you know, volatility in our foreign policy. If you just look at for example uh, you know Turkey uh, started you know uh, you know some years ago as you'll remember with, a, with an approach of uh, uh, zero problems with neighbors uh, and now it's probably at the phase where it has zero neighbors without which it has a problem. So, uh, uh, and I ho hopefully this is going to change because we don't want, as I told you, a problematic relationship with, with Turkey. But Greece has been very, very stable and the strategic nature of the Greek-American relationship is recognized by all parties, you know, maybe with the exception of the Communist Party uh, in Greece. So there's bipartisan support for this. Now, as far as your broader question regarding democracy uh, is concerned, I think we, Greece went through its phase of dealing with the politics of anger and polarization some years ago. So in a sense, we're ahead of the curve. Uh, I remember, you know, 2012, 2013, 14, the you know, big demonstrations, people feeling really angry. We elected the first populist uh, government into power in, in Europe back in 2015. They almost, you know, um, um, uh, took us to the, to the verge of, of bankruptcy. But in a sense, I think we moved into what I like to call the, the world of post-populism uh, politics, where you have a, a reasonable center-right, moderate party that is right now dominating the political uh, landscape that's focusing on, uh, on results-oriented policies and trying to, to unite the country and, and not use a, a rhetoric that is very, uh, very polarizing. Uh, and Greece, ha having gone through lots of ups and downs, probably more more downs and ups, I think they're quite relieved with uh, the state of affairs uh, right now uh, and, and the current state of our, uh, of our democracy and our, uh, and our political um, uh, system. So uh, maybe we're moving back to sort of a, a, a new normal, but maybe also the, the pandemic was an opportunity, as, as I told you at the beginning, to, to bring back the relevance of experts and technocrats uh, and, all, and all those who are frequently attacked by the populace because according to their approach, they don't have the interests uh, of the people uh, as their number one priority. Uh, so uh, I, I'm pr uh, quite um, optimistic about, uh, about Greece, both about you know, the state of our democracy and our ability uh, to deal with uh, the challenges ahead. Uh, uh, as you mentioned in your introduction, 2021 is an important year for uh, Greece, 200 years since the, um, the War of Independence. Uh, lots of uh, common themes between um, uh, the, the history of the United States uh, and Greece uh, in terms of the fundamental values uh, that we share. Um, it's an opportunity to uh, you know, make the case uh, for, uh, uh, for democracy, for rule of law, for the values that have uh, you know, taken us to where we are today and are still you know, the most relevant values that one can envision. I, well, well, Mr. Prime, Prime Minister, you've been very, very generous with your, your time this morning. And on behalf of Brookings, let me just thank you for joining us, um, congratulate you on your successful handling of the pandemic and, and wish your country well uh, in the next stage of, of the reopening and, and re-echo what John Allen said at the beginning, uh, that we very much hope to see you in, in Washington in the not too distant future. 
Thank you very much. Goodbye. And, and on behalf of UVA, let me also thank you, Mr. Prime Minister. Uh, uh, and on behalf of the National Hellenic Society, Greek Americans, I think are ex extremely proud of what not just you and your government have done, but how Greece has responded in the crisis. I know uh, based on the questions coming in, a lot of Greek Americans are eager to come back um, myself included, but um, if we can't do that right away, we are really. Just oh, I'm, I'm sure you will be. I'm sure you will be able to come back during the summer. It may just be a little bit later. Um, <laughs> so there's still time in August. There's still time in August, September, October to have a great time uh, in Greece. So please don't write the summer off. And this is certainly a message to all our uh, our Greek American uh, friends. They will be able to come to Greece just a little bit later than usual. Well. Thank you for that as well, and for all of your leadership and for spending time with us today. And to my Thank friends you. and colleagues at Brookings, this has just been a, a real pleasure to get to, to do this together with you. Um, to our Miller Center faithful audience who has been attending all of these webinars, thanks for joining us. And uh, this is our final event as we now go into summer break, but we look forward to seeing you uh, either in person or virtually come the fall.